Thank you. Shavua Tov. Thank you, Jamie and Rochelle, for your hospitality. Um, I'd be remiss if we, if not, uh, though something that we all recognize and appreciate, the tremendous work that uh, Jesse has been really, not single-handedly, because he has a whole team with him, Jelly. and a whole family with him, <laughs> uh, but that Jesse really has initiated, uh, starting right, right here in this community, I remember a phone call that we had was eight years ago, I think, something, I'm starting this project, Tanakh Study, and will you take a safe fare? And every safe fare I asked is that's already taken, that's already taken. My mom's doing that one. <laughs> and I ended up teaching Divrehe I mean, which was quite an experience. Um, and uh, just every, everything that I've done, I would say done with him, but let's be honest, everything that I've done for him, um, <laughs> um, it has just been, has been a great learning opportunity for me. Uh, even on the technical level, has been an opportunity to meet some fabulous people, uh, both through the internet, but more importantly in person, such as opportunities like this. And we've got a relationship such that I sent him an email and said, I'm going to be in New York three weeks from now. And he emailed back and said, OK, send me a topic. And, uh, and, and it's really um, a delight uh, to be part of the extended uh, community of people who teach Tanakh throughout the world, thanks to what Jesse's done, and uh, on a whole other level to be an honorary member, I guess, or an extended member uh, of the community here. And so it's really uh, a very special delight. And every time I come, I bring another family member. So this time I'm real pleased to have my daughter, Ariella, who is studying at Stern. And, um, and so she's really a neighbor. Um, I'd like to take a look at two different things relating to Matan Torah, or relating to Yitzhak Mitzrayim, in the broader sense. Uh, and I'd like to start with the second one. So I'm going to start at Sinai and go back to Sinai. So please take a look at the source sheet that's titled, Zman Matan Torah Tenu Menala. And in unusual fashion, the source sheet starts not with Sukim, but rather with a rather lengthy passage from Masechet Shabbat that deals with the famous Machloket Rabbi Yossi and Chachamim about whether the Torah was given on Vav Sivan or Zayin Sivan. Now, truth to tell, whenever you use a phrase that the Torah was given, uh, it's a pregnant phrase. And we have to clarify what we mean. So, when you hear the phrase, when was the Torah given, what do you imagine happening at that time or on that day? I don't know if a camera can pan, but what do you imagine? It says the Torah was given on Vav Sivan, the Torah was given on Zion Sivan. What is it you imagine happens on that day? Because when we talk about Matan Torah, we are talking about, essentially, at least four different events telescoping out. We're talking about an event of the revelation, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu announced, and we heard, either 0, 2, or 10 of the Dibrot. Pick your Mepharesh. That's one point. Two point is the revelation and giving of the mitzvot that Moshe got, which comprise all of Parshat Mishpatim that we heard today. Point three would be to expand that and include the rest of Sefer Shmot, which is given atop Har Sinai, the commands regarding the Mishkan, and then fulfillment of those commands. Or if you wish, Matan Torah is a 40-year experience that happens throughout the Midbar and concludes just before Moshe dies. So clearly we're going to exclude the, the last one and the third one from our, from our consideration when we talk about when was the Torah given. When we talk about Zman Matan Torah Tenu, we're not talking about the 40 years. Nor are we talking about the 40 days or 47 days or however long that whole process was. But what is it you imagine when we talk about Zman Matan Torah Tenu? What is it that happened at the time that we're celebrating? Luchot. Hmm? When the Luchot were given. The Luchot were given, except the Luchot were given when? At least 40 days later. Right. Right. So Zman Matan Torah Tenu should be in the summer. Yeah. Right. In a whole different state. <laughs> Deal. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so, 
So I'm not talking Torah Tainu, because the Luchot, as we're going to read in Parshat Kitisa, are given at the end of the 40 days, which is after the revelation of Zman Matan Torah, whatever that is. So what is it you imagine happening? You're not answering because we haven't really wrapped our heads around what that means, Zman Matan Torah Tainu. <clears throat> and because the text is deliberately, I believe so, deliberately vague about the events in Har Sinai, about the timing of everything that happens, and about even some of the sequencing of what happens. <clears throat> As a result of that, the Mefarshim are going, going in different directions relating to the sequence of those events. So at the end of this week's parashah, parashat Mishpatim, we heard about a Mizbeach that Moshe built. When was that in, re- in relative to the Aserat Tadibrot? When was that relative to the Mishpatim that Moshe got in the cloud at the foot of the mountain? It's all kind of murky. So I'll ask you just a side question to, in, to enhance the sense of fog and cloud. Where is Har Sinai? You're right, you don't know. One thing that we know for sure is it's not where they think it is. I don't know where it is, but it is in Santa Catarina. We don't know where Har Sinai is. And the fabulous Gemara in Masachat Baba Batra and the famous stories of Rabbi Barbarchana, where he went to identify where Har Sinai was, and he says, I went there and I saw it was surrounded by scorpions. Whatever that may mean, the implication of that statement is it's an inaccessible place. And inaccessible may not just mean physically inaccessible, but cognitively inaccessible. We do not know where it is. So both the date, the event, and even the location are perhaps deliberately obfuscated in the text. And yet, Come a few months from now, we are going to celebrate a Chag Shavuot, and we are going to say in our Tfilot, Chag Shavuot, Zman, Matan Torah Tenu. And we're going to have Kriyata Torah, in which we're going to read about that revelation and Aserat Adibrot. How did we get to that date? What's the, with this, Audience, I know I can ask the question. What's the only date given <coughs> in, uh, in Sefer Shemot? Not as a command, but as an event. <laughs> the day of hunger. We're going to actually go back to that date in a moment. Otherwise, when is Matan Torah? Well, they arrive by Chodesh HaShlishi. Beyond that, we don't know. We're told that they commanded to bring the Korban Pesach on the 14th. They're commanded to take the Korban on the 10th. But as a, as a narrative, we don't get it. We're not given it with the date. But here's a date relating to the month. But the critical piece is that how is the story of Matan Torah introduced? And yet, in the Gemara, the only debate revolving around the whole <coughs> issue of the revelation. By revelation, they mean by Yered Adonai Al Har Sinai. By the Baral Hamid Kolad, by Ma'ila Lemor Anochi, etc. Is whether it's Vav Sivan or Zion Sivan. And let's take a look at the Gemara because we're going to see some things here that are fascinating. Tan Rabbanan. Bashishi Bachosh Ditnu Aserta they brought the Israel, Rabbi Yossi Omer Bashiva Bo. So right away we get the sense that when we speak of Zman Matan Torah Tenu, we are speaking about the giving of the Aserat Dibrot, not in written form, but hearing the Aserat Dibrot. Machloket, sixth or seventh. Amar Rava. The Kuli Alma Barosh Chodesh Atul Midbar Sinai. Meaning, Rabbi Yosef and Chachamim agree, they arrived in Midbar Sinai on Rosh Chodesh Sivan. Tiv Acha Bayom Hazeb Al Midbar Sinai, Yuchtiv Hata Machodesh Azalachem Rosh Chodeshim. And I think we'll all admit that this is a little bit of a stretch to say that based on Bayom HaZed, to say that that means that, they, that the day that they arrived was Rosh Chodesh, Malan Rosh Chodesh Avkan Rosh Chodesh, meaning there's something else driving this identification of Rosh Chodesh Sivan. Everybody agrees that this revelation happened on Shabbat. Tiv Acha Zachor Yom HaShabbat Lekad Show. So when we're told to remember Yitziat Mitzrayim, it's Hayom Hazad. And so therefore, Zachor Yom HaShabbat Lekacho, we understand, must mean Zachor this day, Shabbat. Meaning, I'm saying it on the day of Shabbat. 
מה להלן בעיצומו של יום, אך כאן בעיצומו של יום, זה די אצלנו. כי פליגים, פליגים בקביעה די ארכה, לא יסלו גמרי, אתם תקו לכאן יורון, their only question was, was, was ER in that year a full month or not? Which means that there was Rosh Chodesh Sivan a Sunday or a Monday. And then do your cheshbon. If it's a Monday, then Shabbat is Vav. If it's a Sunday, Shabbat is Zion. Very strange. The muskamot, the agreed upon axioms here are that they received the Torah on Shabbat. And it's the Shabbat that's at the very beginning of Sivan, around a week after Sivan starts. And the machloket is a very fine machloket, really about what Rosh Chodesh was. It's kind of strange. The question is, where does all of this come from? And as you all know, in two of the mentions of Chag HaShavuot that we have here, one from this morning's parasha, and one from the longer passage in Vayikra, Shavuot is presented 100% as an agricultural harvest festival, relating in no sense, not only to Matan Torah, but to no historic event. Whether Sukkot's related to a specific historic event or not, on the other hand, it's So, whether we relate Sukkot to a specific historic, historic event, it's not a historic event that happened at that time. The only one of the Rigalim that's related to a historic event that happened at that time is Pesach, Chag HaMatzot. But Shavuot has no connection whatsoever in the text, not here, not anywhere in the Torah, and not in the, perhaps, mentioned in Sefer Yumiyam, with Matan Torah. So how do we get there? So there's always the easy answer, which would mean we could go straight to the second shiur, which is one word, which is Masoret. We have a Masoret that happened on Bab Sivan, except we have a Masoret that happened on Zion Sivan. Well, OK, we'll deal with that. And therefore, we can move on. But I think that perhaps we can find it in the text. I want to start, we turn the page, but I want to start by making a suggestion about the nature of narrative in the text. And it sounds like an outrageous suggestion until you consider it, and then I think you'll find it compelling. We generally read a narrative in sequential fashion. Even the school that says, in Muqtam Mukhar Torah, assumes that narrative is presented sequentially, and one event follows the other. And when it is put out of order, it's for a specific reason. The school of in Muqtam Mukhar Torah always has to defend. Why did, why did the Torah write something out of chronological sequence? Because the default is chronological sequence. And that's fine. But we also make an assumption, which I think is a faulty assumption, which is when there is going to be a narrative, that narrative will be all-inclusive of all major events happening. In other words, if we have a particular story about um, Yosef, we will assume that as we're hearing that story about Yosef, all the other things that are critical that are happening in Mitzrayim are going to be told within that story, and not shelved for later because they're some sort of an intersection. But that's not the case. The case is that the Torah tells a story, and it isolates, perhaps anticipating ADHD, I don't know, but it isolates the story and finishes that story out, and then goes back to tell another story. And case in point, how long did Abraham live? 175. Where is Abraham's death recorded? At the end of Parashat Chayi Sarah. What followed Parashat Chayi Sarah? Parashat Toldot. How does Parashat Toldot begin? The marriage of Yitzchak at the age of 40, which means Abraham was dead minus 35. Right? D minus 35, I guess you'd call it. Elon Musk there. And we hear later about the birth of Yaakov and Esau, which happens when Yitzchak is 60, which means Aram is still alive. But we just buried him in the last week's Parsha. Because that's not the style of the Torah. It tells a story, it finishes the story, goes all the way to the end, and then moves back, if need be, to take another story on. 
That's a critical piece of the puzzle because if you take a look um, at something that's not on the page, so take a look in your memories. But you all know it. Because it was from a couple weeks ago, Barjan Peshalach. The story of the man. The story of 36 Psukim, from the beginning to the end of the parable, chapter 16. The story of the man goes over the course of a certain amount of time. And at the end of the story of the man, which takes place when? When does the chief story take place? Somewhere between Yitzhak Mitzrayim and Matan Torah. To put it a fine, more fine point, between Kriyat Yam Suf and Mohammed Amalek. And towards the end of that story, we're told that Hashem commands Moshe to tell Aharon to take a Tzinsenetaman and put it where? Lifnei Hashem. And now, Kasher Tziva Moshe Vayami Yechei Yom Aharon Lifnei Ha'edut. Edut, what? Edut? Excuse me? Edut, what's that? What is Edut? What? Oh, you know that. I know that. We all know that. Except, where are the Luchot to? No Luchot yet. <laughs> no, no, no Luchot yet, because the Luchot are an Edut to what event? Something that hasn't happened yet. It gets better. Uvnei Yisrael achlu otaman arbaim shana. Agboam alkzei eretz kanan. Taman achlu agboam alkzei eretz oshan. Alkzei eretz kanan. How did that get in there? What, 40 years? What kind of 40 years do we have here? What's the answer? It's very simple. The story of the mind, whether written or given orally, is given at some point in Harsinai, we'll say. Or even earlier. When does Moshe Rabbeinu write the Sefer Torah? Before he dies. So he edits the story of the mind. It says, by the way, we've been eating the man the whole time. And it turned out to be 40 years, even though that wasn't the plan. And somewhere earlier in the process, Aharon put some man in front of the Edut, which we all know what it is. That's how stories are told. Good. Now let's go into the Midbar. And let's just follow the chronology of the story of the man. And I think you'll find something that may be surprising. Vaisumeli, top of page two. Let's say Tamir to try and if you properly identify the date. 15th day of the second month, the month that we now call Iyar. They arrived exactly 30 days since they left, or a month, since they left Mitzrayim. Now I have a question for you. We arrived on the 15th of the second month. What day of the week was it? You got no idea. Good, I'll show you in a minute. <coughs> what? Sunday. Sunday. Why Sunday? Because when else are you going to take a trip? It must be Sunday. <laughs> what? We'll see. Well, good. Vayimru Aleyhem B'nai Yisrael. Mi yitain mutainu biyada Adonai B'yarath Yitzvayim. Sounds familiar. Shiftainu al-sir basar balachu v'chlein u'lachem asoba. We were having such a great time in Yitzvayim. Ki avitain otzaitem otanu al-midbar azal amit to call akal azabarav. In the meantime, he took us out here to kill us with hunger. Okay? Understandable. There's two problems here, by the way. There's one problem which is hunger. There's another problem which is, what do they say? You took us out. So there's a more emuni problem going on. So instead of showing them some date trees, or showing them how they can farm in the desert, instead, nes, because it's got to deal with both problems. Now, this... Lechem min hashamayim, whatever it is, and that's exactly what Ben Yisrael say, whatever it is, and therefore they call it, what shema call it, which in Hebrew is man, is going to be given for two reasons. The most obvious one is to feed them. The second is the man anasenu, to test them whether or not they will follow Torah. Let's see how that's a test. Vayam bayom hashishi ve'echinot asher yavim. Vayam yishneh al shal yom yom. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Six days. So on the sixth day, they will prepare everything. And we're not really clear what that means, so let's keep reading. 
Vatchas the machane, over Boker, I taught Shikhwat Atal Savid Machane. Very nice. Vatal Shikhwat Atal, you know, playing a bivar, Dak Mechuspas, Dak for a lot of it. By Ubna Yisrael, we remove Ishalachim Manhu, Vosis Dos, because we know they actually spoke Yiddish. Kidoya Dumahu, Vil Moshe Alehem, right, there's people who actually take it seriously, so I'm glad you laughed. Okay. Hu Alechem, I said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, by he, by Yom Hashishi, Vatu Lechem Mishneh, and we know the rest of it, which is. They collect the double, they all run to Moshe, the leaders run to Moshe. What is this? Oh, who are should be on the line? Shabbaton, Shabbat Kodesh, Talmud, Machar, Tashir, Tufu, Tufu, Tashir, Tvashlu, Bashelu, Bey, Kol, Hodef, etc. Right? Which means, by Yom HaShishi, double fell, the people were surprised, they were concerned about it going bad, and they were told that they were told. What does Bey Yom HaShishi mean? Now we'll look back at that question from two, two, three, two came earlier in the handout. What does Bey Yom HaShishi mean? What? It's six days already. That the six days that they're getting money. Now, if they're getting money for six days, yeah? But isn't that a vav ha'ipuch, the hayah v'yom ha'shishi? It will be. Right. Yeah. Right. It didn't happen yet. I That's in the first command. They, yeah. I'm saying it will happen. Right. And the second one it is, it actually, it actually did happen. Right, correct. Absolutely. So it said it will be on the sixth day. And now we don't know what that means, what will happen. But here we're told that what happened on the sixth day, which we are, you're right, is the sixth day from when it started falling, there was double. Now, what day of the week is the sixth day in the month, sorry? Yom Shishi. Yom Shishi. Which means, when did it start falling? Sunday. So when did they arrive? On Shabbat. And then, of course, you get the crowd, Shabbat, how could they travel? Okay, <laughs> okay. talk about anachronism. Okay, now, so they arrive, and keep in mind the numbers. They arrive on the 15th. What happens that next week? Well, let's pay, pay attention to the narrative because we have to see how things bounce along. By him, by Yom Hashishi, like two lachim yishtesh teyom or lachad, by Avol Kol Nesir, I dare give you the Moshe. By Yom Hashem, who was she? Dibur Adonai Shabbaton Shabbat Kodesh Ladonai Machar. So this is Yom Hashishi. Tomorrow is Shabbat Kodesh. Et Hashet Tafu Eifu Be Hashet Vashtu Bashelu Veikol Al Deifu Nichol Lachal Yishperet Ara Boker. Now, by a nicho to our boker, kashet siva Moshe will be tree malo hay tabo. In other words, until now, there have been people who had left stuff over and had gone bad. They were told not to. So evidently they stopped doing it. On Yom Shishi, they were told to leave stuff over. There won't be any tomorrow. They did, and so we should start acting loyally. Watch what Moshe says. Why don't Moshe ichlu hayom? Kishabat hayom la dunai. Hayom lo tin sa'u basadeh. And notice the three mentions of hayom. Chachamim learned from here. The chiyuv of. Shalom Sudo. When is Moshe saying this? When is Moshe saying this? On the day of Shabbat, the 22nd day of Iyar. When is that? The day of Shabbat is on the 22nd. Yeah, but it's not that day. First of all, it's by Yom HaShavii, which means from this day that we're talking, there's another seven. Moshe comes out. Remember, what did we have? Everybody collected double on, on the first Friday. They came and asked. Moshe said what to do. They're all sitting around watching it not go bad. I'm not sure how you watch that. And then Moshe comes and says, Shabbat HaYom, all very good. And then what, what's the record we get? By Yom HaShvi'i, what's by Yom HaShvi'i? The next week, what date is that? The 29th. Yatsu minal milkot v'lo matzal. By Yom HaShvi'i, Moshe, Anam e'atem nishmur mitzvotai v'torotai v'u ki ha'adunai natan lachem ha'shabat akem ten lachem by Yom HaShvi'i lachem yomayim shvish tatawa itzei ish b'mkomon by Yom HaShvi'i. And now what happens? By Yom HaShvi'i. Let's play with the dates. Is that the third Shabbat? So what what day was the what day? Let's just go backwards. What day did they arrive? Fifteenth. That's clear. I think it's pretty clear in the text. The fifteenth was a Shabbat. <laughs> what day was it that they first experienced the Shabbat of the Man? Meaning yesterday a double portion fell and today nothing went bad. The twenty second. By Yomashvi Yatsumin Amulakot means on the 29th, people went out to collect. They get chastised for it. 
And then what does it say? It can't be the same Yom Shvi. It can't say the same Yom Shvi that people went out to collect, they didn't collect. So what's the next Yom Shvi? Now, do the math. If we hold that the month of ER has 29 days in it, then what's Sunday? First of Sivan, what's Shabbat? Zion Sivan. If, on the other hand, we say that ER has 30 days in it, then that means Monday is Rosh Chodesh and Vav Sivan. And that's the Machloket in the Gemara, by the way, whether or not Rosh Chodesh is Sunday or Monday of Sivan. Which means maybe what we're looking at is two different stories happening, crossing over each other. Because we know this happens in the Man, because the Man jump, jump starts all the way forward 40 years. It starts, at, it goes to the Edut, and then jumps all the way to the end of 40 years, and maybe, if you look carefully at the end of the story, even a little bit further, which is problematic. Look at the Ramban in Parshat Chukat, on, uh, on uh, Chorma, and you'll see a mention of some of the problems at the end of the Parshat Haman. But nonetheless, it does move forward. So maybe what we have is intersecting stories. We have a story of the man that starts on the 15th and continues through, including a Shabbat, which happens to be now three weeks after they started, which turns out to be the Babur Zayat Sivan. You have another whole story that's happening, by the way, while they're getting man. Is anybody here think they're not getting man? Does anybody think they're not getting man during the three days of Hagbalah? Of course they are. That man's happening the whole time. So what else is happening? The first day that B'nai Yisrael, the first Shabbat that B'nai Yisrael actively keep after being chastised, the man on the ha'yelech b'toratim lo, is the day that what happens? I get the Torah. I mean, you raise your hand. Can I guess what you raised your hand about? Maybe. <laughs> well, I, no, I, 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 get, I get to guess. I, but you'll let me know if I'm right. You're asking whether or not by was actually that first one. Yes, and why can't you say that it's by min ha'am that there's a little faction of people that were not following the Beautiful. Word. I'd rather say that. <laughs> because then what do we have is something even better. The day Israel arrived on the 15th. 22nd, there's this big thing. Every time, and there's some people go out. They get chastised. So when do they keep that Shabbat? Do the math. 29th. And if so, then things actually come out, as the teacher might used to say, because that means that they have demonstrated their Shmirat Shabbat. And then how is the next Shabbat celebrated? Either way we put it, the connection between the beginning story of the Man, the Shabbatot of the Man, and the story of Matan Torah, the way Chachamim read it, as I think Chachamim are not operating just with the Masoret of Bab Sivan, because then the Masoret's a little confused, Bab Zayin Sivan. I think Chachamim are simply reading this parasha and saying, since we have as an axiom the Torah was given on Shabbat, based on Zachort Yom HaShabbat Lekadcho and Zachort HaYom Hazeh, that it must be related to the violation and then the keeping of Shabbat that happens in the context of the month. Either they get it on the day that they finally keep Shabbat, which I think is problematic, because then, how does Hashem say, in three days I'm going to come down, let's see what happens with Shabbat first. Or they kept the Shabbat on the 29th, and therefore they were told, aha, now we're ready for Matan Torah on the next Shabbat. But either way, I think the date is something that can be worked really out of the psukim if we read them carefully. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I'm just curious. That's yeah, so um, we're all here. <laughs> didn't they um, have to like kosher their pots and stuff? The Hakamim say they were eating dairy for three days. But man has no status of dairy or meat or anything, right? Is it in part? Well, that's a question that. <laughs> 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 okay, let's see how many questions we got here. All right. The first question is what religion man is? Like what part of kosher? I mean, man, I don't know what it is. Right? We don't know what it is. We know it's some sort of. Uh, Right? But you have to remember that that has nothing to do with this particular shiur. That's just a general question of they were clearly eating man from the 15th of VR on. Right. 16th of VR on. Which means they come to Matan Torah, they're eating man. So whole issues of kashering pots and everything else which led to cheesecake on Shavuot, <laughs> kind of problematic, right? Um, I mean, one of the overall questions about the man is how come at that point they don't just start slaughtering their animals? 
right? Is it not enough for them? Then you have the parshan b'halotcha, tzoni uvakari shachet lahem, yinatzeh lahem, kol diayam, right? So maybe it's not enough for them, but still, do you think they'd start with that? So it's a good question. According to the, I mean, I'm not sure, by the way, where, what's the makor for the idea that Bnei Israel didn't have, weren't able to prepare their, their cooking utensils properly from Matan Torah? Okay, anything you look at? Maybe one of the Okay, so it's fairly late, right. Okay, part two, which may or may not connect, but we're going to go back to Sinai, going to go backwards. <clears throat> There is a famous line in the Haggadah, a line which is prominent and leads to a prominent observation and a ubiquitous, meaning everybody's aware, sort of a, a popular observation better, about the Haggadah, which really flies in the face of the narrative in Sefer Shmot. And that is the Avarti Beret Yitzrayim, Alain Azeh, Viketi Chol Vachor Beret Yitzrayim, Uchol Oheim and Mitzrayim and Seshvatim, Ani Adonai. The Avarti Beret Yitzrayim, Ani Velo Malach. Viketi Chol Vachor Yitzrayim, Ani Velo Sarach. Uchol Oheim and Mitzrayim and Seshvatim, Ani Velo Ashaliach, Ani Adonai, Ani Hu Velo Achem. Which leads, of course, to the great observation when a kid says, Hey, I found Moshe's name in the Haggadah. No, that's your brother Moshe. He owns it. He's name in there. Right? But there's, you know, Moshe Abdo with the Yad and the, the fingers. Right? Moshe's name is pretty much out of it. However, if you read Sefer Shmot, which we do not traditionally do at the Seder, the part of the Haggadah, then you will see Moshe is all over the place. Which leads to the following question. How do we get out of Mitzvah? Did Hashem take us out of Mitzvah? Or do we get out of Mitzvah? And the reality is that the text in Parshat Bo says both things. Take a look on this is the other source sheet. Take a look at source one. It's two psukim that aren't far from each other. Moshav Ne Israel, Asher Ashu Mitzrayim, Shloshim Shem Rama Yotshana, Vahim Neger Shloshim Shem Rama Yotshana, Vahim Neger Yazeh Yatsu Kol Tzivot Adonai Meretz Yitzrayim. And a few psukim later, Vahim Neger Yazeh Hotzi Adonai Bnei Yisrael Mitzrayim Meretz Yitzrayim Hotzi Botam. So, which is it? Did we leave or Hashem take us out? Which is it? So, there's a, there's, it's an easy question to answer, which is, Hashem took us out, so we left. But the emphasis in the first two psukim that are on the page seems to be our leaving. How do we understand that? So, let's take a look At, we'll so, focus on source four, source 4, we'll look back a little bit at Source 3, but Source 4 is the entire Ma'amad HaSnei. And I want to take a look at the famous refusal of Moshe and put it in a different light than we're accustomed to saying. I think it's a different light. U Moshe, Haya Ro'e, Tzon Yitro, Chotem No, Kohen Midyan, Vain Hagetat, Tzon Achar Midbar, Ve'evol Har Adonim, Choreva. So Moshe comes to Har Ha'eloim. By the way, what's Moshe doing there? Why does he come to Har Ha'eloim? Cool. He's, he's, taking, he's taking the sheep away from grazing land. It's a place that's choreb. It's a place that's desolate. Why does he go there? So this sort of makes a suggestion which I think is very appealing. Is that Moshe Rabbeinu, not yet Rabbeinu, but Moshe at this point, was accustomed to going to this place, the Hitpo Dedut, for tefillah and for meditation and trying to come close to Akadosh Baruch Hu. Do we think for a moment, especially fans of the Rambam's Mor and Vuchim, that Moshe Rabbeinu became a Navi like that? That there wasn't a process of training. That's the sort of, but we might mention it further on. In any case, he comes in. <clears throat> We're all familiar with this scene. So this is the setup. This is what we call the matzag. We're now ready for the dialogue that's going to go on. 
ויאמר אל תקרב הלום, זה פרפריישן, שאל נלך מהרגלך על המקום אשר אתה אומר עליו, על מה קורה שהוא. And now Hashem delivers the message. What's the message? And now you're Moshe, I want you to do this. Be in Moshe's, you can't be in Moshe's shoes because they're off. But you're in Moshe's place. I don't get to say that often. You get that with your Yeshua and Moshe and Zeb. ויאמר, אנוכי אלוהי אביך, אלוהי אברהם, אלוהי יצחק ואלוהי יעקב. ויסתר משה פניו כי יראה מהבית על אלוהים. So משה turns away, he's afraid now, he realizes that this is a vision of God, he can't see. ויאמר אדוני, ראו ראיתי את עוני עמי אשר במצרים, ואת צעקם שמעתי בני נוגסיו, כי ראיתי מה חובה, כי ידעתי מה חובה. I see the pain and affliction that my people are going through במצרים. You're Moshe Rabbeinu, at that point, what's your reaction? And, good. וירד להצילו, מיד מצרים, ולהעלותו מן הארץ ההיא, which by the way, if you think about it, sounds very much like the words of Hashem to Yaakov. אנוכי ארד ימך מצרים, ולנכי ארחה גם עלו. The last time we heard Hashem's voice, till now. ולעלותו מן הארץ ההיא על ארץ טובה רחבה, על ארץ עזבת חלב ודבש, על מקום הכנעני והחיטי והמורי והפריזי והחיטי והיבוסי. And so far, you're Moshe Rabbeinu? What's your reaction? It's about time. Shkoyach. I got a 50-yard seat. Very nice. Actually not, I'm in the end zone here. ויעתה הנה צעקת בני זו בא אליי. וגם ראיתי את הלחץ שמצרים לוחצים אותם. Now the word ויעתה, if you're Moshe Rabbeinu, might have been like, uh-oh. Because ויעתה would be, okay, now here's your job. But instead ויעתה is, and now I've heard, what, why is Hashem saying, and now I've heard their voice? Because maybe Moshe, Hashem is responding to Moshe's unasked question, which is, what took you so long? Okay, their cries have come up to me. I've heard them, the pain is so terrible. And it's a theme we find out throughout Tanakh, most notably in Sefer Shoftim, when Bnei Yisrael are just in such terrible pain that their cries are so anguished that our Kodesh Baruch Hu responds. It takes a certain level of brokenness to, to, be, to get there. Good. Vigata. This is where the shoe that Sadan drops. Lacha v'eshlachacha el paro. Now this is where if you're Moshe Rabbeinu saying, I don't get it. You just said what? What did you just say? I'm going to go down. I'm going to take him out. I'm going to bring him up. And I said, Shkoyach. Chazak Baruch. Which by the way is a very funny thing to say in Russia. What does he say next? Now you go and you take him out. It's all weird. This is the first time that we hear Moshe respond. Why hasn't Moshe responded until now? There's nothing to respond to. To clap, be happy, make a kiddush. ויאמר משה אל האלוהים, מי אנוכי כי אלך על פרעה וכי יוציא את בני ישראל ממצרים? It's important to note that this is the beginning of a negotiation that goes on all the way through this part, this passage, this whole parasha. A negotiation between Moshe and Paro, and Mem and Hashem. Between Moshe and Hashem. Who wins the negotiation? Who wins? Sure. Moshe wins hands down. Because think about it. At every point, what could HaKadosh Baruch Hu say to Moshe? Go. <laughs> but instead, what happens? Okay. All right. You want to know my name? You want this? Okay. At every point of the, of the negotiation, Hashem gives in to Moshe. But there's something underneath it driving Moshe. Let's see what it is. Hashem, Moshe says, Mi anochi Now, what do we think mi anochi means? I mean, we know what the words mean. What is he saying? I'm not worthy. Who am I to go to Paro and take B'nai Yisrael and Mitzrayim? Meaning, I'm not worthy. So what is Moshe presenting or suggesting as an alternative plan? Somebody else. Right? Me. <clears throat> but what's Hashem's answer? Hashem's answer is, I'll be with you. Zelacha'ot is a whole sheer by itself. 
Whatever it is, Hashem tells Moshe, I'll be with you. And I'm giving you a sign that I'm with you. At that point, I think Moshe would say, okay. By the way, Moshe says, I'm going to come to Israel and say, what, Elohe? What? Avo? Techem. Why? It's not his. He's not been part of them forever, really. Vamruli mashmo. You guys have a secret handshake. I don't know. There's some secret name of God. What is it? Maomarli him. Now, by the way, again, at this point, Akkadish Baruch Hu said, just go. Instead, what does he say? Say my name. Vayomer Elohim al Moshe Eyeh Asher Eyeh. And in what's a delightful irony, he turns an answer which essentially says, I have no name. What does that Yad Shariah mean? I am. And he turns that non-name into a name. I'm giving you all the names you need. Yeah, Hashem, okay, I will take him, you name it. You got it all. Go. But not yet. Lech v'ya safta zigne Yisrael, v'amarta lehem, Adonai lo hevo techem nira ilai, lo hevo hamo yitzchak v'yakob lemor. And now, I'm going to give you the secret handshake. Because what do they all know, or at least the elders know, that their great-great-great-grandfather, or however far back you want to go, Said on his deathbed. What did Grandpa Yosef say on his deathbed? Pakod Yifkod. And so therefore he said, Pakod Why is Hashem telling him this? Because he's trying to give Moshe the bona fides. He can come and say, I have the inside track. Hashem really appeared to me because no way I could get this information from some other shepherd out in Midian. Now that I'm with you, now that you know my name, and now that you know the message, they'll listen to you. Sometimes it's a new thing. You can't go alone. You've got to go with Zignei Yisrael, which means Hashem, again, is hitting him over. That's a Piece by itself, but that's the bad news. Very nice. So all this news. Pyro's going to be stubborn, and I'm going to send them a coat, and when you leave, you're not going to leave empty handed. All very nice. All nice things that, by the way, you can go and tell B'nai Yisrael. I'm giving you ammunition so that when you go to talk to B'nai Yisrael, they'll believe you, and they'll be happy to hear the message. Very nice. They're not going to believe you. And again, I quote Baruch at this point, so they say, I told you to believe you. Quote. Hashem then gives him the signs. I'm going to skip this. We all know the story. The, the stick, throw it down. The snake, sarat, right? And then if they don't believe that, take water, throw it on the thing, and become dumb. And if they don't believe those two signs, they'll believe the sign of the dumb. Pasuk Yod. And this is the one that's really kind of driving the whole piece. Which we have to look at for a second. What does Moshe say about himself? I don't speak well. Except the Rambam would throw something at me if I were to do that. Because he's scandalized by the thought that Moshe... The most important spokesman of our Baruch in history would have deficient speech. So what does Kfad Pech Vat Lashon mean? A lot of different interpretations. I don't know the language of diplomacy. I'm afraid to speak in front of crowds. 
then there's another piece to the puzzle. What does that mean? Gam mitmol, gam mishalshom. So I'm familiar to Midrash. Tmol, shalshom, gam, gam, seven days. Tmol, shalshom means what in Tanakh? Ever. All history. What does gam miyaz daber chalavdecha mean? I think it supports the Sforno. That Moshe has been getting the Vuan for a while. And how does Moshe know he's not an Ishtvarim? <laughs> I've never been able to talk to you. But the critical piece here is Moshe again is refusing the agency. And with everything said, he now falls back on this idea that I can't speak. Whatever that may mean. I can't speak well. I can't speak with erudition. I can't speak in a compelling way. I can't get certain words out. Even Ezra has an interesting comment that there were certain consonants he couldn't say. Hashem says, I'll give you words to say that don't have those consonants. It's great, Ibn Ezra. <laughs> Whatever it may mean. He's falling back on it, and he could have said that at the beginning. But he doesn't want to go. Why does he not want to go? So let's look at the end, and then we'll get a sense. Hashem says to him, which means I take care of erudition and I'll tell you what to say. However, again, however we understand it. Unclear what that means, but now Hashem gets angry and listen to what he says very carefully. I know that Aaron will speak. Which means, even though he's older than you, he will accept your position as being higher. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to tw- twist that to have it mean that, but that's what it plays out. It plays out. So you're not going to speak to Par. Who are you going to speak to? Aaron. The Samtata Dvarim Befiv. I'll be with him and with you, and I'll tell you what to do. Listen very carefully to this last, the second last pasuk. Moshe, you're going to walk into Paro with Aharon. You're going to whisper to Aharon, and Aharon will be your mouthpiece. He will be your pet. And in another place in Vayira, Aron Achicha, yeah, Neviacha. And who are you going to be? His Elohim. Wow, that's a pretty weird thing. Let's think back and read. We don't have to reread the Parsha, but think it through from a different angle. Hashem appears to Moshe and says, I've heard their cries. I'm going to take them out. Moshe, and I want you to go. What is Moshe's answer? I'm a human being. I should not be redeeming them. Who should be redeeming them? You. Shem says, go. And I'll be with you. What does I'll be with you mean? I will be redeeming them. Through you. So do you want me to make you meet your agent? I got another name. Here's the name. They're not going to believe me. Okay, go tell them a secret code and everything else. So be convinced that I'm with you. Because what's bothering Moshe? There's an essential theological problem that's bothering him. It's not about humility. It's not about timidity. It's not about speech defects. It's an essential theological problem. Who redeems Am Yisrael? Moshe's position is the redemption should happen through HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'Chodo Latzmo. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu's position is yeah, through you. Anochi eyeim picha. Eyeimach. I'll be with you, but you've got to be the one to activate it. Ratzon HaKadosh Baruch Hu is that Am Yisrael always has a human agent involved in the Gula, but a human agent who is backed by Hashem, who is supported by Hashem, who has Hashem with him. This is the battle of the snap. This is the fight that's going on, if you will, in negotiations. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu continues to give in to Moshe. In so far as he gives Moshe the backing, the support, the presence, 
and even to play to the Egyptian court the little parlor tricks. Moshe still won't go. What's the compromise? What's the meeting in the middle? It's going to be a divine redemption. And who's going to be to play the role of the Redeemer? You are. Is what I wanted the whole time. But you think it should be a divine redemption, so you know what's going to happen? You're not going to walk in like a human. Aharon's going to be your Navi. It's a wild and crazy approach. But if you think about it, it's not that much different than what's happening in Paro's court. It means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is meeting Paro, as it were, in his court in his terms. Where he's the deity, he's got his Navi. So what happens? What is Moshe's first message when he comes into Paro? Moshe's first message is, Ko Amar Hashem, B'ni V'chori Yisrael. That's the message he's supposed to give him. I am not, myself, anything but the spokesman. By the way, who's saying the words? Aaron is. Aaron is quoting Moshe, who's saying, Ko Amar Hashem. Which means both things are happening. There is a divine redemption happening because consistently Moshe points. But there's a human redemption happening because Moshe and Aharon take an active role in making it happen. They don't sit back and watch miracles happen. They effectuate the miracles. This, of course, is fantastic because it empowers Am Yisrael eventually to take matters into their own hands and I mean it's not cliche, but literally, Be'ezrat Hashem. And we see that happen in the first war that we're told to actively fight with Amalek. We take up arms, and yet he lifts his arms. Moshe lifts his arms. Be'ezrat Hashem, we fight Amalek. And that's the model for the war. That's the model for the redemption. But there's a danger in this especially living in Mitzrayim, the danger is we could be end up deifying Moshe and thinking that it's Moshe himself who took us out. And therefore, what's the granddaddy of all Makot? What's the pachin panim to borrow from our neighbors in Brooklyn? A cliche. What's the slap in the face, the real punch to the gut? Makat b'chorot. And how does Hashem announce Makat b'chorot? And now it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'chpodo V'atzmo. What do we see happen through the Midbar as we saw in the first shiur? What do Bnei Yisrael continually say to Moshe Rabbeinu? Lama hot seitem otan. You took us out. This is the danger in the approach that Moshe took. And Moshe continually, through the Mibar, has to fight to win their hearts over to show them that I didn't take you out of Tashem. Because this is how it started. And how do we respond to that at our Seder Shal Pesach? We don't read Seder Shavuot. We read some Sukim and Devarim. Vanitzak El Adonai Elohei Avoteinu. Vayishma Adonai Koleinu. No mention of Moshe anywhere there. Ultimately, we bring it back to the message that we want to bring. But the message that had to go through several permutations, as we see in the back and forth between Moshe and Hashem at the staff, that has reverberations all the way through the Midbar and all the way through Moshe's career and negotiations that we have to continually be aware of, and every year at Seder Shal Pesach have to respond to, and to fix, as it were. Like he either leaving Moshe's name on the side, and making this, Ani v'lo malach, Ani v'lo sarah, Ani v'lo shaliach, Ani Hashem, Ani hu v'lo achem. Shavua Tov.